I'm really curious to what it is that you saw on me. I have some guesses, but I have no idea what that is, what it really is. No, I, I sensed a level of sincerity. Mm. And it was more than just a uh, sort of an empty question answer session. Mm. So there seemed to be something more significant there. And uh, so that uh, that compelled me to, you know, consent to another one. Mm. And it's really interesting because I felt like I ended the conversation early last time. Um, I felt like uh, I had a hesitation to go any further because of what I was experiencing, uh, I guess, somatically. Um, I was uh, experiencing quite a bit of fear, which is a normal reaction. I, I feel um, uh, in various different circumstances. The only other time that it's been that intense was crossing the Golden Gate Bridge on my motorcycle um, and having this just intense wave of fear come over me um, and I can't stop the motorcycle because I'm on a bridge. So, uh, and I felt that same sort of uh, fear come up when, when I was talking to you, but much more, much more um, specific. I see. So one of the biggest things that's been on my mind since we last spoke was how difficult it is. I, I gave a, a um, cons consultation for somebody who's interested in coming to me for my massage services. And I ended up, I love talking about anatomy. And so she, she had, she had some issues with, um, uh, with her body and I loved talking about the anatomy, but immediately I started going into these prescriptions of like, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this. And I wonder is without prescription, can we, authentically communicate well i mean obviously we can but yeah i think that i think that with prescription you cannot authentically communicate mm -hmm. um prescription is fine for mechanical things and even sort of exercise related things so you might tell someone to drop to do 10 push-ups or you might tell someone to run three miles or you might tell someone to eat you know, less carbs and more protein. You know, th those are mechanical things. Those are mm -hmm. ingredient-related things. Um, uh, but but anything that is more subtle, more nuanced, more artful, more si significant, um, uh, that's where prescriptions fall apart. So you can teach someone how to turn a screw. You can you can prescribe how to turn on a computer. You can tell someone how to wash a car, you know, but but when we get into more more subtle and nuanced things, that's where uh, prescriptions have no relevance in those in those areas. Now, even so, if you teach someone how to cook something, then you can teach them how to cook a basic level thing. Um, however, a, a chef will mm -hmm. take it to a whole other level which is based upon art, which is not just based upon two tablespoons of this and, um, you know, one cup of that. Mm -hmm. If it was that simple, then everyone would be a world-class chef. Mm -hmm. um, so, so communication is possible only in the most, um, only in the most base level and, uh, and, and relatively menial ways uh, with prescriptions. Anything more significant, prescriptions have no relevance. So what you're saying is like, if you're a, taking a beginner level dance course or um, cooking course, then prescription has its place just to get you to that base level, but then you should give up the prescription as, as soon as possible. I mean, dance is different. I mean, dance is not a mechanical thing. Mm. So dance is, a, dance is art. So, uh, so no, I, I would say that when you're looking at something like dance, um, that isn't, that is, that isn't turning a screw. Uh, so that's an art right from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So to inculcate one into prescriptions with regard to an art such as dance, mm -hmm. uh, the, the danger there is, as they say, you can't become a little bit pregnant. Um, once, once you start someone on that road of prescriptions on something that is fundamentally art, mm. then that person will follow that same tune all the way through. 
and follow the road of prescriptions. So I would say right from the very beginning, if it's something related to a true level of skill or art, that even even the beginning levels, in fact, you could argue that it's the beginning levels that are most important to stay away from prescriptions. Um, so anything mechanical is fine because it's, it, you know, it takes five seconds to learn it, mm. you, you know, but, but anything related to art, prescriptions uh, fall apart. See, it must be, st- it, it must be understood. Uh, the fundamental truths must be understood, and that is that art cannot be prescribed. Um, art emerges. And in order, to, in order to allow it to emerge, one must find the source within oneself from which that art arises. And if one does not uh, become in tune or be given the permission to become in tune with that source, then that precedent will not have been established in that individual. Mm. Mm. And in my own experience in dance or any other skill that I've learned, that rings true because basically what happens is I get taught a certain way to do something. And then later on, I realize that that is a, yeah, a, a foundation or a framework, which then needs to be given up at a certain point. I, uh, yeah, I don't think that you really arrive at that point, though. Mm-hmm. Usually what happens is that once you go down the road of prescription, you remain on the road of prescription, and you go down that sinkhole further and further. And so the effect of prescriptions is that the person will come back and ask, am I doing it correctly? And mm-hmm. is this right? And what do I need to do to mm-hmm. make it better? And you spend the next 60 years trying to make it correct according to the standards and the guidelines of an instructor. So you end up pleasing the instructor. You never end up creating art. Mm. That goes into something you wrote a week ago or so about how the organism, this organism that we inhabit, has no choice what it gets affected by. So going yes. into social situations where you're affected by everything around you, you can imagine that you're, you know, you're, you're protected, you know, you visualize a shield or whatever, but that doesn't really matter. There's still going to be things that are outside your control that affect your, your being. Yes. Hmm. Um, and that's a really good point. <laughs> you, you, you say that there's no way to get out of this prescription thing, but then you show people how to get out of it. And there is a way to, stop relying on it, correct? I don't think I show people how to get out of it. Mm. I just think I just think that I display and demonstrate the danger of going into it and the the mm. profoundly uh almost criminally limiting effects that it has. Mm. I don't say here's how you leave prescriptions. Mm. That would be another prescription. Yes. Uh, so essentially you're preventing future prescriptions. Well, I don't know if I'm preventing anything or not. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just speaking the truth. And whether it resonates with a given individual or not, it does or it doesn't. Um, I'm not trying to change anyone. I'm not trying to convince anyone. I don't think that anyone should follow what I say. Um, I am just speaking the truth about how the human organism responds to things uh, independently of his own conscious will, how the mind works, um, not that you should do it or you shouldn't do it. How can you raise a child without prescription? Well, you know, uh, raising a child is, even that statement of raising a child, I don't think humans raise children. Nature raises children. Mm. I think humans interfere with children. Um, I don't think any human being knows how to raise a child. Uh, And I'm not saying that there is one way to raise it and no one knows it. What I'm saying is, I just don't think that we're wired to know how to raise another human being because we ourselves have not reached 
enlightenment slash wisdom slash realization slash whatever your word is, wholeness, completion, total knowledge, whatever it is. I think that the, the, the person who would truly know is the person who had arrived at perfection themselves. And once a person arrives at perfection slash wisdom, whatever the word is, then all that emanates from him or her becomes the perfect living example. Mm. And that living example creates an environment and a milieu in which wh whomever comes in contact mm. in with that milieu tends to receive all of the, quote, beneficial things with minimally receiving all the non-beneficial things without any attempt or strategy of trying to give them beneficial things and keep away non-beneficial things. Mm. And it seems that people like that are very rare. So your chances of coming into contact with them are very low. Absolutely. Absolutely. Naturally. Mm. Yes. And then due to the other thing that you mentioned about if you are performing at an elite level, then sometimes it's not wise to go into social situations. So sometimes it's not wise to actually go out there. And so it keep, even makes it further esoteric or secret. Um, well, you could reveal all your secrets to anybody. Mm -hmm. Most will have nothing to do with them. Yeah. Uh, so not going into social situations uh, is really more about um, protecting oneself from the effect of the environment and one's, and protecting oneself from the limiting uh, effects of associations. What is the most difficult experience you've had with a client, if any? I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't think of things in that way. Mm. Um, it's all the same types of things in different versions and flavors. Mm. So I don't, yeah, I don't really think of things into the, uh, the most of this or the least of that. Mm. Do you have any influences that you had as a child on what you know now? Or, and I don't want to get into what is the biggest influence. But... Yes, yes. Um, uh, I was very enamored by the wisdom of the ancient sages of the Himalayas, um, the things that they were able to know, uh, the some of the ancient obscure masters of Zen. Um, are very appealing to me uh, with regard to their purity of uh, understanding truth. Those things, those things have made an made an impact on me um, over the years. And it's to my understanding that essentially a lot of the a lot of the truth that you share disappeared from the awareness of human consciousness for a period of time. There was a flourishing of, of, of truth and thought around like 500 BC, and then it all kind of disappeared. Most of it disappeared until 9 AD. Is that, do you ever, do you know anything about that? Well, I would say in general that uh, with the exception of the advent of technology, which serves to create more comfortableness for human beings, um, that comfort really hasn't made human beings more wise or more satisfied in anything. Mm. And, uh, and therefore, aside from that, quote, uh, progress of comfort, mm. uh, modernity mm. ruins everything. All things in society have devolved um, with each passing year, with each passing decade, and with each successive generation. Um, every everything in society um, basically decays. It gets worse and worse uh, with the coming centuries. Mm. And all these meditation practices are included in that in that technology. Well, absolutely. I mean, you as you move further and further from the source of truth, 
then you move more and more into the domain of artificiality and the semblance of things and the cosmetics of things. But haven't these technologies, like for example, Skype, the way we're talking right now, don't they allow for more communication of the truth? You tell me. How many Skype sessions have you done besides mine? Uh, uh, well, I've only done two with you, but I've done a lot of Zoom, uh, Zoom okay. recordings. Whatever the medium was, how mm -hmm. much truth was discussed? Well, last time you talked about my teacher, and I, uh, you had some ideas about him, but I, I would actually argue that his meditation, the, the, which he calls non-meditation, so there was a, and we practiced via Zoom, so, so I, I would say that there has been a fair amount of truth developed because I only with working with him have I would it allow me to be open to what you're talking about well what I challenge is not your instructor mm. what I challenge is your belief in practice mm. but to go back to that original point us talking on Skype and then me allow me publishing it on iTunes allows us to transmit what you're talking about uh, to a much larger population well, it's true, but number one, how much of that population is really interested in wisdom and truth, number mm -hmm. one? Number two, um, if one is sensitive and um, has an affinity for a particular thing, then naturally he will look for the benefit of that thing mm -hmm. and, and basically sing the tune of that benefit, right? And so... Uh, uh, so you you're all you know you're you're on the you're on you you have a you have a bias towards technology mm. so you you enjoy it you like it whatever the word is you prefer it and because you do then you will find the benefit and say well here's a benefit that society does same with those who 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 uh support the idea of school and university. They will find the one benefit amidst all the rubble and say, well, here, what about this? This, so, uh, so it isn't a matter of it's good or bad. My, it, just understand, you know, don't get lost in the minutia. Mm. Understand the essence of what I am saying. Mm. The essence of what I am saying is that technology, while it has increased our ability to communicate, most of what is communicated is nonsense and drivel. Mm -hmm. So, so it has increased the ability to communicate nonsense and drivel. Yeah. Okay, so publishing companies, uh, you know, publications have flourished, and so the ability to self-publish has flourished, and and online blogs have flourished, and everything has flourished, right? So, what is what is written in those things? It isn't truth, right? So, dissemination of what, right? So, if there was if there was but one book written once every 20 years and and it was written it was handwritten and you could only buy it at one store in one city in the entire nation uh but that book spoke the absolute truth i would argue that that would be a far greater boon to humanity than all of this technology and all of these blogs and all of these publications uh put together combined mm -hmm. Right, so so you are correct. The 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 mediums which allow for dissemination, uh, absolutely, uh, are you know have the ability to um, promote and propagate information to a wide audience which has not been available before. That is absolutely correct. But that is but that is dependent upon the fact that what is being propagated. Is truth or nonsense? And if it's nonsense, mm. if it's propaganda, then you could argue that in many ways technology serves a negative impact on society. And this ties in with essentially the exponential rise in data, which has increased the amount of noise out there as well. That's um, right. So that signal has increased, but noise has That's right. vastly That's right. increased. That's right. But then... We talked a little bit about this last time. I am an optimist, and I believe that people are um, starting to wake up to to certain truths because they've spent so much time on this comfort wheel that they're that they're that they're some of them are starting to get a 
hint of a deeper truth. And that's why I think what you're talking about is starting to become more and more uh, spreading faster. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, mm -hmm. perhaps. And, and to those who are truly sincere, um, you know, it is a, it is a joy to, uh, to release information to those people. Does God ever come into what you do or, and I mean, talking does, about the does, does, did you say God? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll give you an honest answer to that. Honestly, it's, if someone is completely devoted to God, whatever the name of God he may use, uh, and he gives his life to God, then that has just a, a, as, as profound a benefit as enlightenment or anything else. The problem occurs when someone believes a God and raises a flag and bows at the altar and attempts to create clever transactions of ex trying to exchange a coconut in exchange for wealth and prosperity. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where lies and disingenuousness comes in. That's, mm -hmm. that's not God, that's a flea market. Mm -hmm. That's a dollar store. And it, yeah, this is the hardest part for me because I've been teaching yoga and I don't mean that with a capital Y uh, for the last three years. And it's a marketplace. It's a total marketplace and it's, and it's um, devoid of any, any, any truth. And they, and the message I keep on getting from society is you've got to f fit your, whatever you're talking about into this little box. And because that's the only way people will buy it. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. You have to lower yourself to the masses. Mm -hmm. That's the message. Mm -hmm. What would be some advice to somebody who is able to hear it, but is also able to hear that voice from society? Well, it depends what that person is seeking. Mm -hmm. If if that person is is seeking uh, pure commercialness then he's better off following the voice of society. Mm. If that person is seeking authenticity because they have no choice, then he will naturally be repulsed by the message of society. However, the interesting thing is that when you are genuine about something, you tend to attract those who are genuine as well. And when that happens, uh, commercialness and, quote, um, making it a living at it, um, and while at the same time remaining true and genuine to it, uh, do not become at odds with each other. Mm. Which m most people in the, quote, spiritual world would completely disagree with you and say that money is, uh, you know, the root of all evil and such. Okay. Well, if money is the root of all evil, then prescriptions have created far more evil than money has. Mm -hmm. the, the, the spiritual world um, is a very disingenuous cast of characters. Uh, they haven't gotten anywhere themselves and they teach others how not to get there as well. <laughs> So that they can, so that they can remain permanent disciples uh -huh. of them, and call them guru, so that that allows them a pulpit to sit on, teaching nonsensical, ineffective techniques that go nowhere. So before you call money the root of all evil, perhaps look at yourself and say, what are you giving to society aside from empty? prescriptions. So I asked you on Twitter about questions because lately questions have become really important to me in, in, in terms of figuring out the truth. And you replied that anytime the questions get mechanical, it just turns into another prescription. So what is the importance of questions 
to finding the truth. Uh, questions create the path. Answers remove one from it. So a question is finding the, it's like finding the precise scalpel that cuts to the heart of the matter. The question creates the journey. Mm -hmm. Whether it's in your profession or in your life, whatever journey that you're pursuing, what is the question that you are trying to answer? And the question is, the question is never the one that you think it is. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's one that you have to go through layers in order to find. Because that very question will create the very specific journey. If your question is this, that, that question creates this path. If your question is this, that question creates an entirely different path. That's a totally different question. If, if the question is, how do I become successful? Okay, there's a path. Mm -hmm. If the question is, how do I remain completely, totally, utterly authentic, because I really want to, and while doing that, become successful, mm -hmm. that's a totally different avenue. Mm -hmm. If the question is, how do I become spiritual? That's an avenue. If the question is, how do I find truth? That's a completely different avenue. In our speaking together, now that we've maybe had about an hour and a half so far of, of conversation, what is the a question you would suggest that I look into for myself? You know, I wouldn't suggest it. I can only tell you that f for me, mm. my question, the thing that is at the core of, of everything that I do is that what is it that is sitting before me right now mm. that I just haven't seen? Mm -hmm. And that and that question, that question um, is like an engine which is constantly going. It is a desperation to me, the greatest fear is that five years from now, I will learn something that right now I could have known. Mm. But because of whatever, um, whatever opaque lens that I may be seeing through, I'm not seeing it. And when I learn it five years from now, I will look back and see that I've wasted five years that I will never get back. Those are the greatest fears of my life far greater than any death. I welcome death this very evening. Death can come any time. In fact, I will tell you, I think I've lived long enough. I've seen enough. Death can come whenever it wishes to me, personally. It can take me whenever it wants. But the idea of wasting my life, of wasting years, because things that I haven't seen, because I didn't have the wisdom to see it at that time, is completely unacceptable to me. Why then do humans have this mm, habit of not, not seeing the entire picture, not seeing what's in front of them? Lack of interest. But it seems it has to go deeper than that because there's no, certain- No, humans you know, are very, human beings are very preoccupied individuals. They're caught in the momentum of everyday existence. There, do you know how many fires there are to put out every single day? Mm. Everyone's life is caught up in putting out fires. Mm. Whether it's fire in a relationship, fires at work, the fire of where do I need to go, the fire of why haven't I got there yet, the fire of why, what pleasure I need to satisfy this week, the fire of how come that person doesn't like me anymore. The, do you know how many fires there are? Mm. There, there's, there's 80 lifetimes worth of fires. When, when is the time that they have free of being lost in the fires uh, that they have to look for anything called truth? Mm -hmm. The momentum of that river of domestic existence is extraordinarily powerful. What truth have you found in the last week uh, that you didn't know previously? I, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, it's, it's, it's much more of a 
mm. a matter of depth than it is of content. I never leave it mm. because I don't have any choice. Mm. The further, I mean, this is back to relative stuff, but the further you get to truth, then the less choice you have, whether you choose to see it or not. Well, uh, yes. I mean, you know, one of the common things that I get from, from clients is that now that I have seen even a glimpse of the truth, I would rather die than go back. Mm. That's a very common sentiment. So how do you deal with this paradox? of essentially, and not deal with it, that's the wrong word, but how do you um, work with this paradox that essentially what you're saying is that the closer you get to truth, the more pleasurable it is, but it no, pleasure... The truth, the truth is not a movement towards pleasure. Mm. The truth is a movement uh, towards the absence of need of pleasure. Mm. Which then brings a certain amount of joy and bliss and pleasure though, right? If it does, it does. But usually it's, like, it's kind of like organic fertilizer mm. where it doesn't make your lawn bloom right away. Um, mm. it, it sort of takes time and it, there's, it's much more, you know, things that are hyper sweet tend to be very sugary. Yep. Right? And things that are bittersweet tend to be more real. Mm. So it isn't, it isn't about pleasure. It is about no longer needing it. Mm. it it's it absolutely is not about pleasure because pleasure fades. Pleasure is here one minute and it's gone the next. Um, when you discover reality, reality never changes. It never leaves. Once you have a realization, you are changed forever. You can never go back. Even if you try, you can never go back because now you know something. Mm that before you did not know and you cannot and you will never pretend not to know it mm. some people try though right no they don't <laughs> they they pretend not to know things that they don't really know uh, yeah they get kind of close to the truth and then back away or well, because the, the world of pleasure become, is more, mm. more pleasurable. Mm -hmm. The truth is not an experience. Mm. It is a steady realization which brings you to a new plane of existence. Human beings tend to chase experiences so that they can bask in the pleasure of the experience that they had and then attempt to have it again. Mm. And this is really interesting because what I've, what I've been seeing is, is what we were talking about earlier is that people are starting to get more, uh, re they are starting to realize that the basic material pleasures are not sufficing in the way they used to, but now there's a, a trend towards the experience economy. Yes. Uh, so creating experiences that, that, and now it's, you know, getting all wrapped into that commercialism that you're talking about earlier, earlier. Uh, but it's, that seems like a huge, um, a huge, uh, trap as well. Yes, absolutely. So the truth is not an experience. It's not something that you can, it's not, doesn't have a content which you can express. Uh, well, well, we can talk about it practically because if it isn't practical, it's useless. Mm -hmm. What is it, what is it that troubles you most in life? Is this fear. Um, of? Uh, well, it's this fear of going crazy there is a fear of death as well. Um, fear of going crazy. What, what does that mean? It means that I worry that I have this ingrained idea that spiritual practice leads to, can lead some people to go crazy, schizophrenia, uh, uh, other things. 
things. Um, so I worry that I'll lose my mind and I won't, I, I won't be able to come back. So when you talk about truth, I immediately, it's like a gut reaction that it's like, don't go there. That'll, that, that's going to send you off the bridge. Of course, the truth is always the opposite. And, yep. and the truth is that losing your mind is precisely the path to sanity. Mm. Um, the presence of your mind allows you to hear thoughts. Mm. Do you not hear thoughts? <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah. And do you not see things that aren't there? Do you not read into things that no one said? Yep. Okay. So do you not believe that you are someone that you're not? Mm. Okay. Yep. What you already are crazy. Yep. <laughs> okay. So so man is fundamentally a schizophrenic. Mm. And losing his mind is precisely the way out. Yeah, it's so interesting. Because it has been shown over and over and over to me again that every time I fear something, it's never it's never the way I actually fear it. Um, and yeah, it's the mind's way of preventing you mm. from going on the journey. Mm. Because the mind does not wish to die. Mm. You mentioned that all pain is referred pain. Can you talk more about that? I believe that was in relation to technique. Um, Whenever one sees a flaw in technique, it is only the novice instructor that attempts to fix the flaw at the level of the flaw. Mm. Mm. He fails to understand that that flaw is the natural effect of a cause which happens miles and miles away. Do you have an example of ways a master could correct somebody not at the level of the flaw? Uh, yes, you would allow them to... For instance, give me a topic. Mm. What is what is the topic that you dance? Dance, uh, yes, in dance. I'm sure uh, I haven't been in dance classes, but I'm. They're all the same. Mm. Everyone's the same. Mm. I'm sure that they correct the position of your leg, or tell you to raise it at a ninety degree angle. And if they see a flaw in the te technique, that they correct that flaw that they see. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, yeah. and, and so what is producing that flaw is not the knee. It is not the leg. What is producing the flaw is a lack of understanding mm. of where the movement is arising from. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have a self-taught dancer who has no idea where anything comes from, mm. And he would be completely illiterate mm. if you told him anything related to dance. But you ask him to dance, and he dances beautifully. That kind of thing actually can happen only without instruction. Because that person is not looking for the, the permission of an instructor. As a result, he has no mechanical tendencies. Mm. And because he has no mechanical tendencies, all things are effortless. The entire dance is one movement, mm -hmm. not 25. You cannot break a dynamic movement into a static instruction. Mm -hmm. Art class <laughs> is an oxymoron. <laughs> So I'll give you a specific example. I was I was in a dance class uh, four days ago, and I'm dancing with a woman, and um, she tells me to my relax my arms. Um, and of course, when you tell someone to relax, you're, they're never going to relax. Um, mm -hmm. And and I still don't know how to relax my arm. Mm -hmm. And there is something what you're talking about where there's some it's a very deep tension um, in my in my body. Yes, and if you understood where inside your body you were tight, that the tightness would not be arising in your arm. Mm. The, the tightness would be arri arising within the lower abdomen. Mm. 
Mm. And that will be the center of where all your relaxation would occur. And if it occurred there, mm -hmm. then that relaxation would pervade your entire body. So whatever you tell someone to do, this is one of the flaws of instruction that instructors don't seem to ever understand, is that whatever you tell someone to do something, the person will always overdo it. Mm. And the reason that the person will always overdo it is because their attention is fully on the doing of the thing. However, if their attention is completely on the allowing of the dance, then all things happen in their own proportion. Mm. But if you tell someone to do this with their knee mm. or their leg, then that movement with the knee or the leg will be out of proportion mm. to the rest. And then mm. they will go to every single body part and correct that, mm. and you'll be 92 years old. And yeah. even when you're 92 years old, you will still come back one last time before you die to say, is that correct? <laughs> with a dying breath. Yeah. It is a complete farce. It is a scam. What is the point of chronic pain or how can one work intelligently with it? You know, I'm not an expert on pain, so mm -hmm. I don't know how much of a, um, a complete answer I can give you, um, but I will say that a lot of physical pain is a manifestation of emotional pain. Mm. And then how does one work with, intelligently with emotional pain that may be not totally uh, integrated or felt? By divorcing himself from the need to be rid of it. Mm, yep. And no, that does not mean accept it or embrace it. So you've never had any practice, any yoga kriya, any any pranayama, anything like that. Not, none of that has ever served you any value. I have never done any of those things. Mm. And you don't see any value in anybody do doing them? There's value in everything. Mm. There's value jumping into a mud pit. It might cleanse your skin. Mm. That isn't the question. Mm. The mm. question is, does it take you to where you want to go? Mm. And if you want uh, a slightly improved complexion, then a mud pit may be just what you need. Mm. So again, it comes back to the question you're asking. That's correct. That's correct. The destination creates the avenue. Mm -hmm. And an answer isn't, has nothing to do with destination because you've already been locked in to the destination. Yeah, the, the, the question is like a, um, it's, it's like the question is like the, the hand of the sculpture, the sculptor, mm. Mm. which, which removes the excess and gets to the essence. And once the essence is there, then the path illuminates. Because every path is question specific. Mm. Like you said, is there a benefit to any of these things? Mm. Yes, I'm sure there's a benefit to everything. Mm. What is the question? If your question is, is there a benefit, then you will spend your whole life chasing benefits, and that's <laughs> fine. And that's, and then that's fine. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You, 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 will, you will arrive at your goal. You will get benefit from this, and you will get benefit from that. Mm. But I will tell you right now that no one is really seeking benefits. They may think that they are because it gives them temporary pleasure. But if they were seeking benefits, then when they got the benefit, they would stop seeking, but they don't. And the reason that they don't stop seeking is because they're looking for satisfaction, looking for truth, looking for something that lasts, whether they realize it or not. 
So then how can one find freedom in all things? Well, the freedom in all things is freedom from one's mind. It is freedom from the chase. It is freedom from prescriptions. It is freedom from pleasure. It is freedom from temporariness and fleeting things. It is freedom from the attraction to things that do not produce satisfaction. And that is sincerity. And the more sincere one becomes, not because he should, but because he just is, the more sincere one becomes about arriving at a goal, the less he tempts, the less he tends to be tempted by temporary and fleeting pleasures. Have you ever worked with anybody with intense mental health issues? Yes. And it does the have you helped them? <laughs> Or, yeah. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. but even in mental health, it depends upon one's level of sincerity. Mm -hmm. There's always a level of lucidity somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. But mental health is far more related to the average human than it is to a hospitalized patient. Mm -hmm. I think that's the real mental health or mental health issue mm. is normal life. Because it's almost designed to keep us trapped. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pervasive chronic misery and pain mm. Mm. and illusion and swings of mood and all of those things um, than a full-blown psychosis. Mm -hmm. It is just that full-blown psychosis is more dramatic mm -hmm. and catching to the eye. Mm -hmm. And whereas the psychosis of everyday man mm -hmm. goes unnoticed because the one who notices is himself psychotic. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it it is a it is a democratic psychosis. It is a societally sanctioned psychosis. Do you have any hope that humanity will um, survive the next fifty years? I don't think about that. Uh, I think much, I think there is no humanity. There's only a human. Mm. And it is it in perfecting a human uh, and allowing a human to arrive at wisdom that is humanity's greatest chance of anything. Mm. What is the point of survival unless you live in wisdom? What is the point of nonsensical ideas like life extension? Mm. Why would you want to extend a miserable life? Mm. Why would you want 50 extra years of pleasure chasing? Mm. Humans are just enamored by the idea of more. Mm -hmm. So you, if you had life extension possible, available to you, you, you wouldn't take it? No. <laughs> no. To me, life is too long as it is. Uh. 
Now, I will admit to you one thing on a situational basis, and that is if, you know, my son was getting married and I was going to die and, uh, you know, a, a very specific situational thing, mm -hmm. it would be nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but it, in general, um, no. You know, short life, quality life. How are you so comfortable? I guess you just said it, but how are you so comfortable with this, with death? I guess life hasn't really impressed me much. Mm. The things that I've learned from life um, really have not uh, given me a sense of satisfaction. Mm. This is, uh, I, I completely agree with Buddha. Life is suffering. I do not, I, it, it has not been my experience in the things that I've witnessed. And uh, just examining my life and the lives of others and, and man in general, that the, life is a life of pain. Mm. This is not a life of peace, wisdom, freedom, and, and satisfaction. It is a life of change. It is a life of loss. It is a life of ups and downs. Um, yeah, I, I do not, I don't find a great solace in this thing that we call life. There's no kind of beauty to that experiencing of all that loss along with all the, the, the I beauty. That's, I think that's philosophical jargon. <laughs> Thing that's more positive thinking huh. and empty spirituality. Hmm. What does neurosis mean to you? Yes, it is the default experience of human <laughs> beings. Do you read? Do I read? I mean, like, are you are you reading anything right now? Is the real question. Um, no, I don't really read. Um, you know, occasionally I'll, I I might come across, you know, a few words from an ancient, you know, master of some sort, and I may become inspired by that. Mm. Uh, you know, those kind of tidbits here and there. Mm. But I, I to to get a book and read the book. I, I, I just don't. I'm not impressed by mm. books. Um, they're just full of prescriptions. Mm. So you're not a fan of Krishnamurti. I think Krishnamurti was a very, very sincere individual, um, but he suffered from a. He suffered from a need to make those who listened to him mm. as sincere as him. Mm. He was desperate for those who listened to him, who attended his lectures, to, mm. to seek with him together. Mm. And I don't think he understood that human beings are just not that way. Mm. Um, and no matter how much he pleaded... There, he, he's, he doesn't, he, that's completely unrealistic. Mm. You know, he would have, would have been far more effective if he just stated what he found. And the one out of a hundred million who was ready to listen, he would have listened. And he kind of never got to the point where he was okay with that. Mm. Uh, but from his, his own standpoint, I find him to be an extraordinarily sincere and serious individual. Mm. And and I applaud the depths to which he explored life and the the, the nature of human beings. I truly do. Mm. Have you come across any 
ninth century tantric um, masters at all? Um, you know, I'm. Uh, you know the the ancient masters who sort of lived in a forest and mm. and sat on a rock as they taught only a sincere disciple uh, without trying to make him a disciple. Mm. Um, you know, those individuals tend to appeal to me who were mm. completely rejected everything. Uh, because they saw through all the nonsense and the hype, and they spoke straight truth. Uh, those people tend to, the, 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 the purists, the, the individuals who didn't follow any crowd, who weren't part of any group, uh, those tend to, individuals tend to speak the greatest truths, mm. and they, they speak to me. I don't follow anybody, mm. um, but I am inspired by some. Do you have a lot of people on Twitter or other places sending you like hate mail or um, getting <laughs> mad at you? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I just take a look at the comments. Yeah, yeah. I get I get my share of those. <laughs> um, you know, block and mute are uh, perhaps the greatest inventions of of, of Twitter. Yeah. Um, but yes, I get I get my share of that, uh, along with um, sort of nonsensical comments of people who clearly are not interested in reading what's there. Mm -hmm. They are only interested in an opportunity to respond. Um, and and by the way, I don't ask anyone to read what is there. Mm -hmm. If it happens to speak to them, it happens mm -hmm. to speak to them. Yeah, this is the hardest part for me so far with kind of honoring and speaking the truth is, is the, the imagined my neuroses about, about um, the reaction that people have. Sure, yeah, you're, you are, you know, if you're looking, if you're looking for others to agree with you, mm. I mean, that's, that by itself is false. Yep. Mm. You really have to be a universe of one. Mm. Validation mm. is that is the road to hell. Mm. But how do I uh, uh, stop <laughs> wanting validation? But then, how do I stop wanting wanting stop wanting validation as well? Uh, you know, validate the need for validation stops when you are satisfied by the purity behind the words that you speak. Mm. When that when that satisfaction is enough and does not need to be supported by any extra validation from anyone else. Mm. When that isn't enough then you will need to supplement. And in the supp supplementation, you will lose your way. You will begin catering to the crowd. And in catering to the crowd, you will lose yourself in the crowd. The only really worthy pursuit of anything is to do something that people generally have not seen anywhere else before and not from the standpoint of being the first but because your level of purity has gone so deep that you just so happen to be the first mm. without trying to be so mm. the first in going so deep as opposed to the first in bringing something to the world. Mm -hmm. Things that happen out of sincerity are the things for which you have no choice. Which is why all this bullshit about um, uh, studying all these CEOs and um, finding out their tricks and, and Productivity hacks are is all just kind of nonsense. Complete nonsense. Yeah. 
it's like a it's like a um bystander or a mm, Those, yeah, those are just mimicry, mimicry turns you into a wannabe. Yeah. It turns you into a second rate individual. Well, we go back to the title that, that you mm. that you wrote for the first podcast. Mm. Everything is a scam. Mm. I really thank you so much.